Bibles, we'd like to direct your attention to the 24th chapter of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 24, and we're going to speak to you tonight, and this may be a little long message, and uh, some of you will perhaps think that that's nothing unusual, but it's hard to bring you an introductory message concerning the tabernacle and the wilderness unless we do spend a little longer time on the message tonight than ordinary. And we do want to introduce our subject tonight and be prepared next Thursday night to take up piece by piece this wonderful building and its camp called the Tabernacle in the Wilderness. We're going to speak to you tonight about the history of the tabernacle, the description of the tabernacle, and what it means. Why should we study this building? Why should we learn about this ancient building? And why should we profit from the study of this ancient building. So the history and description and the meaning of the tabernacle in the wilderness will be our message tonight. In Exodus chapter 24, where we first meet up with the tabernacle, in verse 12, we read, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, which is uh, the old English translation of the original word, and it is the name of the tree and the wood that we referred to as acacia. Oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. The book of Exodus is commonly called the book of redemption. It is more or less a historical book, yet the doctrinal roots of the great truth of redemption are laid deep in the book of Exodus. The history opens in the slime pits of Egypt, and in chapter 1, as the book begins, we find the children of Israel in the bondage of Egypt. They had been there many years were made slaves by the Egyptian pharaoh, were put to work at the brick kilns in Egypt, producing bricks. And as they worked in the slime pits, making bricks, toiling ever, they murmured and cried unto the Lord, who heard them and who moved in their direction to save them by sending from the backside of the Midian desert a Savior whose name was Moses. Moses had actually been 80 years in preparation for the ministry that God used him for in Egypt. The first 40 years of his life was passed in the Egyptian court of Pharaoh as an adopted son of Pharaoh. The second 40 years of his life was passed in the Midian desert on the backside, tending the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro. For Moses, knowing early in his life what God had chosen him for, endeavored in the energy of the flesh to perform the will of God and hence was driven out of Egypt before he could accomplish anything. On the backside of the desert, 
we find Moses humbled, broken at the feet of God, and ultimately after 40 years of practically no ministry at all, we hear of him before the burning bush, hearing the commission of God to go into Egypt and deliver God's people from the hand of Pharaoh. Moses went down with his brother Aaron and with the rod of God in his hand, and there they performed by the power of God many miracles, showed many signs in Egypt that God was with them. And on the fourteenth day of April, by the blood of the Passover lamb, when the midnight hour had passed, they rose up as one in the middle of the night and left Egypt. This is referred to as the Exodus. And that's the reason this book is named Exodus. They made their departure from Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. And you know the thrilling story of how God intervened and destroyed Pharaoh's hosts and saved them from the hand of the enemy that day. On the other side of the Red Sea they sang praises unto God and rejoiced that God had thrown the horse and his rider into the sea and that their God was a man of war. They stood in victory in a strange land several hundred thousands of them without provisions. The only thing they brought out in the way of foodstuff was bread that had been unleavened, for they left in haste. And there they stood in a strange land. On every side were enemies without food and without provision, with their wives, their children, and their babies. And they had none but Moses to lead them. But Moses knew the living God and the living God had called these unto himself. And beginning with that day, we have the marvelous account of God's grace in meeting every material and spiritual need in Israel's life in the 40 years in the wilderness and in the years to come after they had camped in the Promised Land. Not many days after their departure from Egypt, they came to a mountain whose name was Horeb, commonly called Sinai. This mountain had many superstitions connected with it. The inhabitants of the land believed that God himself lived up in the, the lofty crags of this mountain. In fact, it, its very name, Horeb, meant Mount of God. Sinai means my thorns. And this mountain was held in such superstitious awe that very few ever went near its lofty peak. But here at Mount Sinai, as they were camped at its base, God spoke, and the glory of the Lord came down and encircled the mount, the peak of the mount. They saw many manifestations of the very presence and glory of Almighty God on the peak of the mount. And out of this thundering and lightning and display of his glory and presence, he spoke to Moses, and he called him up into the mount unto himself. And Moses got himself up into the mount, and there at Mount Horeb, God spoke to Moses and showed him many wonderful things. And he gave to him the law, which we commonly call the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue. And not only did he give him the ten words of Sinai, but he gave him all of the holy regulations rules and laws found in Leviticus, recounted in Deuteronomy when Moses was about to die and go home with the Lord. But he also gave to him in the mount, as we have just read from Exodus 24, the pattern of a house of worship. There in Mount Sinai, God gave to Moses a pattern and told him that he was to build according to this pattern a house for God to dwell in in the midst of Israel. Now to give you a little bit of its history before we go into the detail of how it was built, on the first day of April, and the scriptures are wonderfully clear on this subject, and there is so much in the Old, Taber in the Old Testament about the tabernacle that one cannot read the Old Testament without being impressed with the fact that it must have tremendous significance Else why would God fill so many pages of the Bible with an account of the tabernacle and so many references in the Old and New Testament together? The book of Hebrews in the New Testament is almost entirely written to explain the meaning of the tabernacle, its service, its priests, and its sacrifices. 
On the first day of April in approximately the year 1491 B.C., this tabernacle was completed and was erected at Mount Sinai. We know also from studying the Old Testament history record that this was just 14 days before the very first Passover. The Passover was to be kept in memory of what God did in the midnight hour in Egypt. Fourteen days before the first anniversary of the Passover, the tabernacle was completed and it was pitched, much as you see it here, at the base of Mount Sinai. It remained in this geographical location for the next fifty days. And after fifty days, a strange thing happened. The, pit, <coughs> the pillar of cloud which you see resting over the tabernacle and remained motionless during the day and was replaced at night by a pillar of fire. And this was to signify the presence of God. Suddenly on the 50th day after the camp was pitched, this pillar of cloud moved. It moved from off the tabernacle. And God gave instructions to Moses that whenever the cloud moved, they were to move. And so they dismantled the tabernacle. And whenever the tabernacle was moved, it was a tremendous task. And if you think it's not a tremendous task for a little portable building like that, I'd like to get way ahead of myself here for a minute and tell you that the foundation of that building weighed five tons alone. Not counting the building itself, the foundation upon which it was erected weighed five tons, 10,000 pounds. It took six covered wagons, huge covered wagons drawn by a yoke of oxen apiece to move the tabernacle and its paraphernalia. And when the cloud moved from off the tabernacle, it was a sign to Israel that the tabernacle was to move because God was leading them and they were going on. We're not trying to draw any types tonight. We're just giving you the facts of the tabernacle. And later you will see what a wonderful picture of the Christian life it really is. So after 50 days of being camped at Sinai, the cloud moved and came to rest at Kadesh Barnea on the borders of Canaan land. There the camp was again erected and remained in that place for 37 years because at Kadesh Barnea the people in unbelief fell back from the borders of Canaan would not cross into the promised land, and so for 37 long years they camped on the very borders of the land that God promised them. After 37 years, plus a very short journey down towards the Egyptian peninsula and back up to the borders of Canaan, which lasted about a year, they were ready to cross into the land. Moses was taken home to be with the Lord. He was not allowed to cross Jordan into the Promised Land. A new leader was called of God and anointed and put in his place. His name was Joshua. And under Joshua, the nation of Israel moved across Jordan's waters, and as they dismantled the tabernacle and took the great veil which hangs within and wrapped the Ark of the Covenant in it and put it on the shoulders of the priests, the priests went ahead of the people and as their feet touched the waters of Jordan, the waters rolled back in a heap, and the whole nation crossed on dry land and went over into the land which God had promised to their father Abraham many years ago in the land of Ur of Chaldee. Once they crossed Jordan, <coughs> they picked out a place, and directed by the cloud, they pitched the camp at a place called Shiloh in Ephraim. In the territory designated to Ephraim, the son of Jacob, at a place called Shiloh, which means peace, God told the children of Israel to erect again the tabernacle. It remained at Shiloh for a great number of years. Shiloh eventually, during the Philistine Wars, fell to the nation of Philistia, and once it fell into enemy hands, the tabernacle was quickly dismantled and moved and the next appearance of it in Old Testament history, we find it at a place called Nob. Nob was 
as its name implies, a big tall hill. And it was four miles north of Jerusalem. And <clears throat> it was a full 30 feet higher than Mount Zion, which was supposed to be the highest peak in that vicinity. It was eventually moved from Nob and erected again at Gibeon. And from Gibeon on, we have no record of the tabernacle excepting in Second Chronicles 5, we find that as time went on and God eventually gave to the nation a king, David first desired to build for God's glory a permanent dwelling place in Jerusalem. And even though it was David's dream and David's desire, much like Moses, he was not allowed to, force, uh, to see the fulfillment of his vision and dream. David died before the tabernacle was erected, but he left five million dollars as a personal gift in the building fund. And after he died, his son Solomon, who ascended the throne, carried out this vision and this dream under God, and the temple was erected in Jerusalem. When the great and glorious temple of Solomon was built, the tabernacle found no more use and was taken down. Kind of a sad thing. And after 200 years, as their place of worship was folded up, stored in the temple as a relic and a memorial of their days of wandering, and they entered into a, an era of glory never equaled before nor after in Israel called the era of Solomon's glory and temple. The Ark of the Covenant, however, which rested back in the Holy of Holies in the back compartment of the tabernacle, was placed in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And when that ark was brought into the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple, the glory of the Lord filled the house, the Bible says. And the presence of God was so manifest that the priests could not even enter the building. So God put his personal approval upon the temple of Jerusalem and upon the presence of the Ark of the Covenant which had been with his people for so many years in the Holy of Holies. Now this is where we'll end our short history of the tabernacle because there are several burning questions and we'll not answer those until we come to the individual messages on the Ark and so forth. For instance, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Was it destroyed? Where is it today? We know where it is. We know why it's there. And I think I can show you when the time comes from the Word how it got there and when it got there. So much for the history. Now for the description. The tabernacle is, in my mind at least, probably the most amazing building, without any question the most amazing building that was ever erected. This was a long time before they developed prefabricated buildings. It was a long time before anybody ever considered making a portable building that could withstand weather and the rigors of taking down and putting up again. But this building was amazing in that it was the only building ever constructed on earth. That's a fantastic statement now. It's the only building ever erected on earth that was absolutely perfect in its construction, absolutely without any arrow beyond any correction by man, there is absolutely nothing that could be added to its construction to strengthen it or to better it. It has for a number of years been a marvel of architects who have studied it as a temporary building, a building that can be dismantled and erected again. This building was perfect in every detail. It was perfect in every minute detail of its construction due to one thing. It is the only building ever built on earth that was completely designed by Almighty God and whose blueprints were given in the smallest, tiniest detail for its construction by God himself. <clears throat> no man designed a tabernacle. No man had anything to do with it 
in his planning and in his architecture. This building was completely designed. Its construction plans were given wholly by God himself, and hence it was without any error whatever. In Acts 7.44, when Stephen was preaching to the Sanhedrin, he made mention of the tabernacle in the wilderness, and he said it was appointed by God. And the word appointed means thoroughly arranged. And so he says that God thoroughly arranged all of the details of the tabernacle when he gave them to Moses on the mount. Now I think another outstanding thing about the tabernacle building itself is that it's a very small building. Actually, do you realize that the dimensions of this building are only 15 by 45? It's 15 feet wide and 45 feet long and 15 feet high. It isn't as long as my house. It isn't nearly as wide. And it isn't as high. It actually represents a house that's only a two-room house with one room about the size of an average living room, 15 by 30, and another room the size of an average bedroom, 15 by 15, representing only 675 square feet of space. Think of this, the amazing smallness of this building. 675 foot in his floor space, two-room house with one room 15 by 30 and one room 15 foot square. But the amazing thing about this small house is that it has been estimated to have cost more than two million dollars. How would you like to build a two-room house and get two million dollars in it before you got done? I think that's what they're doing now, but <laughs> two million plus is the estimated cost of the tabernacle building, a small two-room structure, total of 675 square feet, 15 by 45 by 15 in its overall dimensions. The base or the foundation upon which this tabernacle building rested cost over $200,000 simply for the foundation. And the total cost of this building, if you break it down in square foot area, would figure out about $3,000 a square foot of space. Now we're going to give you briefly a description of the tabernacle as it's set up here in this picture. And this chart is drawn to scale. Uh, that is as near as you could draw a chart like that to scale. And uh, everything is in its right proportion as near as we're able to ascertain from the scriptures. And you can get an idea from that how the tabernacle was set up itself. First of all, you'll notice that the tabernacle sits inside of a fenced area. This area is 75 feet wide, it's 150 feet long, and it is called the Court of the Gentiles. This area is completely fenced, and standing outside, since this fence is seven and a half feet high, it would be very difficult to see anything with the exception of the upper half of the tabernacle building itself. So the view of an outsider would simply be this, a large fenced-in area, and inside that fenced area all he could see would be the fire from the brazen altar, the pillar of cloud as it arose from the top of the tabernacle building, and the upper portion of the tabernacle building itself. This court was made of uh, 60, yes, yeah, 60 brass pillars. Each one of these pillars was solid brass, and it rested upon a foundation of brass. They were situated about nine feet apart, and there was a brass ring on the top of each one of these pillars. The tent material, or the covering that goes between the pillars, 
is fine twined linen, impossible to see through it, very heavy, very white. Each piece of linen was approximately seven and a half foot square, or approximately nine by seven and a half, and was held in place by the two brass rings on either side of the linen itself, or on each of the poles, or the pillars. Then the pillars were fastened to the ground, or made secure, by ropes which came down from that ring also on the pillar, to a peg which was solid brass, and the peg was eighteen inches long and driven in the ground at an angle, and it was staked within and without as you see it there. Now, think of this. Each of these pillars made of solid brass, resting on a brass foundation, each with a brass ring at the top, the linen fastened tight between them, the ropes pegged down on both sides of the outer court, held down by 18-inch pegs made of solid brass. Then on the front, you'll notice there's only one opening into this court of the Gentiles. It is a 30-foot opening. Three, four, yeah, four. Four sections of the east side of the court of the Gentiles was given to the door. There is but one door into this place. Who knows who the door is? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the door. By me, if any man enter in. This is the presence of God. This is the place of worship. This is the meeting place of God and man, and all who come to the presence of God must come by the one door, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a 30-foot opening. It was made of five or four pieces of specially constructed linen, and this linen was embroidery. There was fine needlework on this linen of, uh, gold, of purple and scarlet and of blue. Uh, These four pillars at the opening of the court of the tabernacle of the, of the Gentile were made of solid silver, and they rested on brass foundations, and the linen, as I told you, was embroidered with fine needlework interwoven with scarlet and blue and purple thread. Now, once inside this courtyard, no man was allowed there without a sacrifice. But once inside the courtyard, the very first thing that you come into contact with is this little matter here called the brazen altar. I think it was approximately four and a half foot square, but we'll go into more detail on it when we get to the brazen altar. It was made of solid brass, and it had a horn on each corner of the altar. And you've heard many times in the scripture of the four horns of the altar. Well, this is in reference to those four horns. There was a horn on each of the four corners of the brazen altar, made of solid brass, had a grill work uh, here where the ashes would sift through, and there were several utensils, flesh hooks, vessels, and so forth used in connection with the brazen altar, and this was the place of sacrifice. There was a burnt offering made on this altar every morning in Israel. This was a part of the priest's daily ministration was to offer the burnt offering unto God. You'll notice on either side of the brazen altar is a stave, or two staffs, which were never to be removed from the four rings on each corner of the brazen altar. Inside, when we get in here to the altar of incense, you'll notice the staffs are also on that altar, and they are also on the table of showbread, and they are also on the mercy seat back in the Holy of Holies. It was to ever remind Israel that they were a pilgrim people that they must be ready to move at the very word of God. These staves were never to be removed as long as they wandered in the wilderness to remind them that this earth was not their home, that they were only passing through, they were pilgrims and strangers, and at any moment they would be called upon to move on. This is the brazen altar of sacrifice. This was the place where the sin goat was killed every year on the 10th day of October or the great day of atonement. This was the place where the many trespass offerings were made. This was the place where the daily sacrifice was made. This was where all of the blood sacrifices were made in Israel, here by the side of this brazen altar by the priest. Now, no man was allowed to go back here to tabernacle building save the priesthood themselves. The, the descendants of Levi represented the priestly tribe. They were the only ones allowed back to the tabernacle for inside of the tabernacle building 
was carried on the worship of God, and also on the great day of atonement the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to present the blood in atonement for Israel's sins. No one was allowed in this building but a priest, and he wore his white linen garments spotlessly clean, and he was barefoot, but he could not enter this tabernacle building unless he stopped by this strange-looking vessel called the laver of cleansing. This was a brass, uh, well, what should we call it, a bathtub? It was something similar. It was a huge brass basin, water in the top of it, and water in the bottom rim of it. Their feet and hands had to be washed before they could enter in the tabernacle. And when the priests served a number of hours in the courtyard, they went in out of the tabernacle many, many times, but every time they entered into the tabernacle, they were compelled by the law of God to wash both feet and hands. The simple reason for that was this labor of cleansing was a type of the daily cleansing of the believer in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he who would worship God, he who would walk in his light and eat his showbread and offer the incense of our prayers upon the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ must have clean hands and clean feet. And as often as we pray, and as often as we feed on Christ, and as often as we desire light and walk in the light, we must be cleansed moment by moment by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. And these priests were never allowed to forget that. They could offer the sin sacrifice here, which was a type of Calvary. They came to Calvary once, but from Calvary on, they went many times to the labor of cleansing, not to be saved again, to be kept cleansed moment by moment, that they might walk in a clean fellowship with the Lord in his tabernacle. So this was the labor of cleansing, and then we come to the tabernacle itself. It has a very, very strange construction, as you will see in this picture here. Can you see? This is the way the main structure of the tabernacle was made. Now you'll notice it's all covered up here. You can just see the corner of this framework, and it's all covered up by the skin coverings, which we'll tell you about in a minute. But this was the framework of the tabernacle. It's an amazing building, a wonderful building. Notice, first of all, it is made by taking a number of boards here, 20 boards here, yes, and 20 here, and eight on the back end, or the west end, made 48 boards in all. These boards were three inches thick, they were 27 inches wide, and they were 15 feet long. They were made of acacia wood. And this acacia wood, once formed to this size, was completely covered on all of its four sides and ends with solid gold. These boards are solid gold-covered acacia. Think of the tremendous wealth represented in that framework. These five pillars on the front of the building were solid gold, and they set upon a, a, a base of brass. These were silver. There were four of them back here in the partition. They were silver, but the rest of it was overlaid with pure gold. First of all, let us look at the foundation. This foundation was formed by 100 blocks of solid silver. The blocks were said to weigh a talent apiece. Now, a talent weighs approximately 100 pounds. Each one of these blocks weighed approximately 100 pounds, solid silver, and there were 100 such blocks, and their total weight would be 10,000 pounds or 5 tons, and their estimated worth was almost a quarter of a million dollars. These solid blocks of silver were laid out in a rectangular shape, excepting the front. As you see here, there was no pillar, uh, there was no silver here. But the silver was laid in the three sides of the rectangle, and each of these pillars, or each of these blocks, I beg your pardon, uh, had a socket in it or a hole. And you'll notice that two of these are laid together to form the foundation for one board. And there was a socket in each of these blocks. And on the end of the board was a tenon or a peg. 
which extended down and fit very snugly into the socket of silver. And so the boards were stood up right on their end. The tenons on each end of the board slipped into the sockets of silver, and there they stood end by end, six or forty-eight boards around. Now once they were stood up like this, there was a hole or a slot running through the boards completely around. You see I've shown it by this dotted line here. And there was a bar of a casey wood overlaid with gold that went inside the boards completely around the tabernacle building. They met down here at the end in uh, a joint, and so this bar was said to be continuous around the tabernacle building. Besides this continuous bar, which was hidden, or run inside the boards, there were four boards or bars on each side of the tabernacle. You see them here. And they were held to the boards by rings, rings so perfectly fitted into this board, Josephus said, that they seemed to be growing out of the board. And these bars were slipped between the rings, and that's what held the bars together. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, who wrote about this tabernacle building, said that these boards, overlaid with pure gold and bound together by five bars on each side, were so perfectly fitting that at just a very small distance it was impossible to see the cracks where the boards came together. They were so perfectly polished and fitted to size, so machines to size, if I can use that modern word, that the the uh, line that divided the boards was almost invisible. That's how tightly that building fit together. Now you think about that from an architectural standpoint a little while, and you'll have to admit that that's a pretty sturdy building, isn't it? Think of it sitting down in this five-ton foundation of solid silver. You don't have a house, I don't suppose. That, well, maybe you do. Well, you have a house that has a five-ton foundation on it? 10,000 pounds? You might have. I don't know. That's an all heavy foundation for a portable building, a little two-room house. Five tons of solid silver, each board with its tenon right down in there. And I can't help but tell you a little typology tonight, even though we didn't intend to get into it tonight. This is a wonderful picture. Well, I'm not going to tell you about it now. We'll tell you about it later. <laughs> just, just in a little while. I want to describe this building first, and it's hard to, uh, to keep it all straight. These, uh, each one of these blocks of silver, incidentally, was equivalent to 3,000, yes, 3,000 shekels of silver, and uh, uh, the total worth, I told you, was $200,000. Now, the roof. Let us notice the roof that was put on over the top of this. The roof had four layers. You'll see it here, white first, blue, scarlet, and then skin-colored or grayish. Uh, it was a grayish-brown color. The first covering was a covering of linen, fine twined linen as white as could be made in that day. This first layer of linen was composed of ten pieces, six feet wide, forty-two feet long, running in a strip. And you notice the skins were stripped like that too. Well, the linen was stripped like that too, ten pieces, six foot wide, and forty-two feet long. These were sewn together in two big pieces, and the two big pieces were fastened together by 50 gold clips in the center of the tabernacle building. Then the second layer, well, first of all, to finish with the, the linen covering, uh, inside, where only the priests could see, if you walked into this gold building, that's what it was, sitting on its silver foundation, and you looked up, all you could see was the white linen in all directions. But this white linen had very fancy needlework in it and embroidered on the ceiling and on its sides were pictures of the cherubims. And the cherubims were the guardians of God's holiness. No man has ever seen cherubims, although Isaiah described them and Ezekiel described them too in their vision. When the Isaiah had his vision and he saw the Lord and Ezekiel had his vision and he saw the Lord, and they both described these cherub beams. They're angelic creatures of some kind, created angelic beings who guard or have to do with the holiness of God. And they are appear, at least, according to Ezekiel and Isaiah, to have four faces. 
One is like unto an eagle, one is like unto a lion, one is like unto a beast, and uh, one is like unto a calf or a bullock. And so these golden cherubims, uh, like were on the mercy seat, are also inscribed on the inside of the white linen. They were embroidered there in fine needlework, in scarlet, in purple, and in blue. Over the top of this linen covering, you'll notice the next one is blue. This was a covering of goat's hair. Goat's hair woven into a fine, very heavy covering. It was composed of 11 pieces. They were 6 feet wide and 45 feet long, just a little longer than the others. And they were held together by 50 clasps of brass. Over the top of this fine goat's hair, which covered the linen, was another covering. This covering was made of ram skin. And the ram skin sewed together dyed a deep scarlet. And the fourth covering, or the outside covering, was made of the skin of the badger, or the porpoise, as we would call him now. And these porpoise skins, or badger skins, were sewed together and were, of course, the outside covering to repel the weather. And they were very drab, grayish-brown. doesn't show it there, but they were a grayish-brown, I think, more than brown. And they shed, of course, the rain and the wind. And they came down and covered all of the inner coverings of the tabernacle. And you know, the amazing thing and the wonderful thing is that <clears throat> there's two views of this tabernacle, one from without and one from within. And the man who is outside this court is a type of the sinner. He has no access to God. He's outside. And what stands between him and the dwelling place of God is this wall. And you know, dear brethren, that this wall is made of posts of brass, and brass always in the Scripture is a type of judgment. And between these posts of judgment hang the fine white linen of the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And no man can come into the presence of God save he come through the door, for the wall was much too high to climb over. It was righteousness he could not duplicate. And between every sheet of righteousness was the reminder that except he have this righteousness, he come to the brass of God's judgment. There was only one way to enter this presence of God, and that was by the door. And this door is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason why the door is scarlet, speaking of his crimson blood. And that's the reason why it is blue, speaking of his heavenly nature. And that's the reason why it's purple, because it speaks of his royal person, who came from the glory, who came from heaven, and shed his crimson blood that there might be a way into the presence of Almighty God. And if you are outside, all you can see is judgment because of the righteousness of God. And the only thing you can see of Christ is a very drab appearance indeed. You know, I've often thought of this and how the world looks upon Christ and they see nothing attractive in him. There is no thing of beauty that men should desire him, so the prophet said. They see the rough covering of a Galilean carpenter. They see the rough covering of a Jewish prophet. But those who have come by faith through the door, seeing Calvary's altar, received God's dying lamb, gone by the labor of cleansing, into the very place of worship. Ah, once within that building we see something besides the drab covering of the Galilean carpenter or the Jewish prophet. We see within the holiness, the righteousness, the deity, the glory, the beauty of the Son of God. We see the blood-sprinkled mercy seat, the showbread, the table of incense, and the golden candlestick. We walk in his light and eat his bread and offer the incense of our prayers unto God and have peace by the sprinkled blood. You know, it does make a difference whether you're inside or out, doesn't it? And it makes a difference from where you view Christ. And if you're outside of Christ tonight, there's only one thing you can do. Come to the door. That door opens to Calvary. And the very first thing that's revealed to the man who will come to the door is the altar of Calvary's sacrifice. And there he sees the Lord Jesus died in his place instead. And by faith passes that altar to walk in daily communion, daily cleansed, and in a place of worship and a place of fellowship with God. Now let us go inside the tabernacle building if that were possible. At 
the door of the tabernacle, as you see here, were five pillars of gold. Five pillars of gold, each resting on a platform or base of brass. On hooks of gold hung this large veil, which was also intricately filled with embroidery work in scarlet and in purple and in blue. And this fine twine linen, again, had all of the fancy needlework depicting many things, or too many things to describe to you, flowers and other things, but there were no animals on this veil. I can't explain it, but there were no animals pictured on this veil at all. Many other things, like flowers and plants and intricate designs, were made, but there were no animals pictured on this veil. Once inside this veil, we come into the building proper, and we find that it's divided into two rooms. Can you see this? This is just a little low here. But here's the way the, the building was divided. Coming inside the veil, we find one large room, 15 by 30. And then at the back of this room is another partition. It has four pillars made of silver resting on brass foundation and another huge veil hanging over it. This veil here inside the tabernacle has four cherubims embroidered on it in gold, in scarlet, in purple, and in blue. So if you walked in the tabernacle door or through this first veil, you would see the second veil blocking your passage into this last room. At the end of this room is an altar, a small altar, which was made of acacia wood, overlaid with pure gold, and it is called the altar of incense. And there was an incense fire burning there constantly, day and night, never allowed to go out representing the prayers of God's people. Here on this side, you can't tell what that is, but that's supposed to be the golden candlestick. This golden candlestick was really, and I should correct that, it wasn't just a, a candelabra with seven candles on it. They didn't burn candles in the tabernacle. It was really a lampstand. And on the top of each of these whatever they are, there, were, there was a little oil lamp or a dish with oil in it and a wick laying out over the side of this dish of oil and these wicks were burning. This golden candlestick with its seven lights was never allowed to go out. Daily, one of the priest's duties was to trim the wicks and to replenish the oil supply which he made himself and see that the lampstand was burning brightly always in the tabernacle to see that the incense altar was always burning and that the smoke of this incense was drifting in through the second veil into the very presence of God, for this was called the Holy of Holies. This large room was called the Holy Place, but this room was called the Holy of Holies. So here is the lampstand, here is the incense altar, and on the right side of the tabernacle as we enter is a table. On this table are daily baked fresh loaves of bread, unleavened bread. It was called showbread, and it was the bread or food of the priests. And when they ministered in the temple, or tabernacle rather, this was the food that they ate. This was the bread that they existed on. This was their portion when they labored in the tabernacle. They ate of the fresh baked bread called showbread, they walked in the light of the candlestick, and they, walked, they constantly kept the altar of incense burning. Notice here in the table of showbread and here in the incense altar are the staffs again, reminding them always that they were temporarily there, that at any moment they might move out. And I tell you, you believers, you better recognize that everything you have in your life has the two staffs in it. This is not our home. We're only pilgrims and we're strangers. And you know, about the time we start to root down, about 50 days later, God moves with the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day, and we're on our way again, reminding us that heaven is our home. We're citizens of the glory, and that one day the cloud will move on, and in that cloud we will be caught up. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel with the trump of God, and that we who are alive shall be caught up together with those who sleep in Jesus, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this was the, the room called the Holy Place, 15 by 30, and back at this partition hung a huge veil. Now this second veil, as I said, was embroidered with fine gold thread, with scarlet, with purple, 
and with blue, four cherubims appeared on the face of this veil. No man in all of Israel was ever allowed through this veil with the exception of one man. That one man was the high priest in Israel. He was only allowed to go inside that little room one time, one year. He went every tenth day of October or every great day of atonement. Just one man in all Israel, the high priest, the anointed high priest over the tribe of Levi, was the only man allowed in this little room called the Holy of Holies. It was only 15 foot square. There was nothing in it but one article of furniture, and it was the place of the presence of God. It was the place where God personally promised to meet with man. It was the place of communion. It was a place where God and man met, but they met in this article of furniture. This was a strange article. It was, first of all, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was nothing more than a chest, approximately three and a half feet long by a foot and a half wide and deep, with no lid. It was just a box. A box called the Ark of the Covenant. It was made of a casey wood, and it was completely overlaid with beaten gold. It had two staffs, just like the other altars, and looked like the table of showbread, for it was to be moved on to when the tabernacle moved. Then God told Moses to be sure and build a lid for it. This lid was known as the mercy seat. It was made of solid gold, no wood in it, solid gold. And on either end of the mercy seat was fashioned a golden cherubim. These two golden cherubims, one on each end of the mercy seat, had their wings outstretched. And these wings touched over the top of the mercy seat. So here was a chest about so long and so wide and so high, overlaid with pure gold. On top was a solid lid, a solid slab of gold. And on either end of the solid gold lid was the golden cherubims and their wings touching over the mercy seat. There was a golden crown or work around the top of the lid. This was called the mercy seat and on top of the Ark of the Covenant it rested. In the Ark of the Covenant God placed the tables of stone which he gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. They were laid up and in the Ark and this made it the Ark of the Covenant the covenant of Sinai. These covenant stones or covenant tables were placed in the ark. Later, God told Moses to take the rod of Aaron, which budded, remember, and blossomed and brought forth its fruit and place it in the ark for a memorial. And later, he said to take a golden pot and fill it with the manna that the Israelites fed on in the wilderness and put it in the ark of the covenant. And so we find in the book of Hebrews in chapter 9, the Holy Spirit telling us that in the Ark of the Covenant was the tables of stone, the rod that budded, and the golden pot of manna. <laughs> Boy, you know, bless my heart, yesterday I was reading over the book of Revelation where the Lord Jesus said to the church of Smyrna, And to him that overcometh I will give to eat of the hidden manna. I wonder what he meant by that. Well, keep tuned. We'll probably learn before we get done. This mercy seat was the place of communion. It was the place where God met man. But he met man only on the basis of the shed blood. Once a year, God made a remembrance of the sins of Israel. And the high priest on the great day of atonement stood by the brazen altar killed the sin sacrifice, caught his blood in a basin, put his body on the fire to be consumed as a burnt offering, and carried the blood back within the veil, back within the second veil, into the very presence of God. And there, without saying a word, he took the basin of blood, dipped his fingers in it, and sprinkled it seven times on the mercy seat between the cherubims. And God promised, that when this blood of the sin sacrifice was sprinkled upon the mercy seat, that he would cover the sins of Israel for another year. And when that blood was presented 
and God was uh, satisfied for the moment with this blood covering for their sins. The high priest came out of the, of the uh, tabernacle, changed his garments, laid his hands on a second goat, confessed all the sins of the nation over his head, and sent him away in the wilderness by the hand of a fit man never to return. Now, we want to discuss with you the meaning of this tabernacle building. If you'll look, please, back in Exodus again with me at chapter 25. What is its spiritual meaning? All we've given you so far has been facts and figures. And it's necessary to do that in this first message. You'll get no more facts and figures. This introductory message is only to introduce you to the dimensions of the tabernacle, the construction of it, so that you will be able to see the typical meaning of it as we go along. First of all, in Exodus 25, 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And here in this verse, coupled together with New Testament teaching, we have the very first type established. First of all, the purpose of the tabernacle was that God would have a dwelling place that he might dwell with man. But if you will please now turn to the New Testament, to Ephesians 2, and see that in the New Testament, God is building another type of dwelling place. And hence, this second dwelling place that he is building is the fulfillment of the type of the tabernacle. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, at verse 18, we read, For through him, that is Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy habitation or temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And the word tabernacle itself, translated out of the Greek, can be translated tent house or habitation. Now I want you to notice then, and this I promise by the grace of God, God helping me in these messages on the tabernacle, we will not establish any type unless we find them established in the Scripture. You can't just go indiscriminately through the Scripture saying, oh, I think this is a picture of thus and so, and that's a picture of thus and so. Well, that's only your opinion. The only true pictures that we can see in the tabernacle are the pictures that the Holy Spirit himself indicates in the Word of God. We can't just say every little hook and every little pin means this and means that because every little hook and pin in the tabernacle is not explained, but some of it is. And what we do find explained is wonderfully seen in the things of the New Testament. First of all, then, the very first type of the tabernacle is this. It is a type. The building itself is a type of the church, which is his body. Now, I think you know, if you've studied the New Testament or read it any at all, that the church is not a building. The church is not made of stone and wood. The church, which is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, is an organism. It is made of living stones, Peter says. It is made of men and women, boys and girls, who have been washed in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the only church that's going to be in heaven. And it's the only church role that's ever going to be called. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. This church is made of living stones, men and women, washed in the blood of the Lamb, joined together in Jesus Christ, and they are growing, Paul says in Ephesians 2, unto a holy habitation for God by His Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in saved people. God indwells this church, this tabernacle, this habitation by His Spirit. And you know, this building is a wonderful picture of believers. It's a wonderful picture of the body of Christ, 
a wonderful picture of the habitation that God dwells in now. You'll notice that each one of these are individuals in a sense, and yet they have lost their identity, for they have now become one. I am one of those boards in God's holy habitation. Once I was a desert tree, wild and untamed, my roots deep in the world system, cut down by the word of God, fit and polished, and overlaid, <laughs> oh, I thank God for this, with the righteousness of Christ, so that no longer I, but Christ lives now. It is Christ whom God sees in his holy habitation, not me. It is me covered with the glory. You may look upon my flesh tonight. You may see me as I really am. But God sees me only in Christ. And he sees me covered with his own precious Son. And I am one, and yet I am not one. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free in this building. We have all been made one in Jesus Christ. Look at it, individuals. And what do you think we are standing on? <laughs> I'll tell you, brother, we are standing on the silver of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The silver of redemption. Silver is the type of redemption. You say, how do you get that? Well, because the only thing acceptable to God for redemption money was silver. He wouldn't take anything else. What did Judas betray the Lord with? Thirty pieces of silver. You can trace it all through the Bible and find that silver is God's picture of redemption. And here standing upon the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ, are the saints of God. Boy, you know that's wonderful. <laughs> Five tons of redeeming work under that building. That ought to be enough to hold us up, shouldn't it? Most of us, that is. And notice too, dear brethren, that we are bound together by invisible bonds. <laughs> I thank God for that. You know, people look at this tabernacle building, one how stood up. They wonder what held the thing together. But there was bonds held that building together no man could see. And it was built upon a foundation that no man could see. A foundation that couldn't be moved. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. And built upon this foundation of his redeeming work are the saints of God bound together by invisible bonds. And you know the number of bars on each side of that building was five, and that's the number of grace. And it's grace that holds us together. It's grace that has made us to stand. And it's grace that has fashioned us into a holy dwelling place for the living God. Boy, it's a wonderful thing. Here we stand individually. Every believer has his own individual standing on the redeeming work of Christ. And yet every believer is made one with others who have been bound together for eternity in the invisible bonds of the Lord Jesus Christ's body. The scriptures teach that we are saved, have been made bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, joined not only to the Lord Jesus who is the head, but joined to each other. I would to God that every believer knew that and that every believer walked in the realization of it. So many man-made barriers have been erected between us. And there is only one thing that holds us together, that's the redeeming work of Christ. There's one thing that makes us one, that's the bars of his grace. There's one thing that makes us one, and that is that we are all together formed into a holy habitation of God by his Spirit. So that's the first type. We'll develop it further and more in detail later, but that's just a preview of what that message will be like on the subject of the building of Christ. Now, notice in Exodus 25, 8 again. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I believe that not only is it a type of the church established in Ephesians 2.18, but it is also a type of the individual believer. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5.1, Paul speaks of living in a tabernacle. Did you ever read that verse? All right, I'll read it with you. It's in 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So this tabernacle is a type of individual believers too. You know, we're in a tabernacle now. You and I are living in a tent house. 
I think you know this. I am not a body. I'm a soul. I live in this body. This body Paul calls his tabernacle, his tent house. He was expecting to move out of his tent at any time. And he says, I know that if this tent house, this tabernacle, this earthly dwelling place that I live in now were dissolved, I know that I have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. These bodies are decaying. They're dying. They started to die the moment we entered the human race. From the day we drew our first breath, our bodies started in the process of death. The deterioration of this flesh has been going on steadily, 24 hours a day, day in and day out, week in, week out, month in and month out, and soon we begin to see the ravages of time upon this earthly tabernacle. But Paul said, I rest in this assurance. It is only that, a tabernacle, a tent house, a wilderness dwelling place. And if it dissolves, and that word in the Greek means if it halts for the night and I can't get it started again. Isn't that a good term for death? Halt for the night and he can't get it erected the next morning. It's a tent. He takes it down at night and he can't get it up in the morning. It won't go anymore. It's worn clear out. The tent pegs are broken. The skin of the tent is leaking. It's coming to pieces. It won't stand another erection. It won't stand another day's journey. It won't stand another day of desert heat and trial. Paul says, when that day comes, that it halts for the night, I have a building of God, and it wasn't made with hands, and it's eternal. It won't be a tent house. It will be a building that will never deteriorate, a building that will never die. A building that will never pass away, a building that will never dissolve, a building that will never halt for the night, a building that will last throughout all of eternity. He was speaking, dear brethren, of his glorified body that one day he would have in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you know this tabernacle in that sense then, it's established in the New Testament, is a picture of the believer. Ours won't last as long as Israel's did. They carried it around for more than 200 years. Ours won't last that long, but one day they came to a place, dear brethren, where they didn't take the tabernacle anymore. They moved into a permanent, glorious building. And in that day, the building of Solomon's temple was declared to be an eternal building. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. The foundations of that building were laid on bedrock, and huge slabs of granite six foot square were laid on top for foundation stones. It was supposed to be an immovable building, but there came a time, centuries later, when Titus and his Roman legions came into Jerusalem and dismantled that building stone for stone. There is no continuing city in this present scheme of things, but there is for the believer a house for his soul, a glorified body, a body fashioned like unto the Lord Jesus his own. And one day when the wilderness marches over, the old tabernacle will be laid to rest and we will take on the glorious building of God. Do you know, that tabernacle building wasn't destroyed. It was in the temple, and it was an integral part of the temple. And that which made the whole heart of the tabernacle building, the Ark of the Covenant, became the whole heart of the temple building. And so we have in type something about the resurrection there. Yes? The seed dies. And another is resurrected, and yet in some sense it is the same. These bodies of flesh halt for the night. They lay in the grave. They return to the ashes and to the dust from whence they came. But yet we ourselves occupy a body so different, glorified like Christ, yet of the same. Who can explain it, Paul says. Now, let us hasten on in Exodus 25, 9. Here's the third type. Notice that God told Moses, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. This is the third type that's established in the tabernacle. Listen carefully. This is the most important. 
When Moses was in the mount, God told him to make it according to the pattern, according to the fashion. This is what the word pattern means. It is a die. You know what a die is? It is an architect's plan. It is a painter's model. It is a pattern. It is a writing copy. It is an image. It is a form. Moses in the mount was shown the painter's model. He was shown the architect's plan. He was shown the form. He was shown the image. He was shown the die. He was shown the original copy of the tabernacle. In the New Testament, other terms are used to describe the same thing. In Hebrews 8, 5, if you want these references, the Holy Spirit says that Moses was to make it according to the example. This is a different word, which means an exhibit for imitation. It means specimen. It means outline. In Hebrews 9, 9, the Holy Spirit says Moses was to make a figure, or make it like the figure, rather. And this word figure is our English word, parable. And it means to throw down beside something to explain the other thing. Now, when you tell a parable, you throw a fictitious story down beside the truth to explain the truth. And in the New Testament, this is another word describing the pattern that Moses was to build the tabernacle after. In other words, the, ta the tabernacle was thrown down beside something real to explain that which was real. And in Hebrews 8.5 and Hebrews 10.1, the tabernacle was said to be a shadow. Now a shadow is an imperfect portrayal, and a shadow does something else. It proves that which is real. When you see a shadow, you know that there's reality behind it someplace. You may not see the reality, but the shadow proves that there is reality, for it takes the reality to cast a shadow. And God says that the tabernacle building was a shadow. What then is the reality? Let us turn to Hebrews 8, 1, 2, as we bring this message to a close, or try to. Hebrews 8, 1, 2. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Listen very carefully. We have such an high priest, he's talking about Christ, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, notice now, a minister of, and the Greek says, the holy places, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not man. Here in these verses we have this established. In the heavens, where the throne of the majesty is, there is the true tabernacle. The word true is a word which means genuine, as opposed to that which is only a copy. And the Holy Spirit said that in the heavens where the throne of the majesty is, for the Lord Jesus Christ is seated tonight, our high priest. There is a true tabernacle which no man had anything to do with pitching, which the Lord himself pitched, and the only high priest who has access to those holy places is Christ himself, who is here described as a minister. And you know what that word minister means? It means a worker who belongs to the people. And today, while I was reading this verse, I was made to thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ is a minister. He belongs to the people. To put that in plain language, dear friends, he's on our side. He is there for us. He belongs to us. He is not there representing God. He is there representing me. He is not there as God's spokesman. He is there as mine. For if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father, even Christ Jesus the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, but not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world.
It is Christ seated at the right hand tonight for me who makes intercession for me according to the will of God. Now, if you will, please turn over to Hebrews 9. Look in verse 11. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, notice, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And here in these two verses you learn that there is a more perfect tabernacle, a greater tabernacle, of which this was the pattern, this was the type, this was the picture, this was the image, this was the resemblance. And in this perfect tabernacle, in this greater tabernacle that's situated in heaven tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ himself entered into that tabernacle, right into the Holy of Holies where God dwells, and carried his own precious blood, and instead of like Israel's high priest obtained a temporary forgiveness, Jesus obtained by the sprinkling of his own blood an eternal redemption for us. Now, I want to sum up what we have just said. Moses was called up in the mount, and God showed him the die. He showed him the pattern. He showed him the architect's plan. He showed him the painter's model. And he said, make sure that you build your tabernacle exactly like this pattern. For this building was to portray, dear friends, what the tabernacle of heaven is really like. Now, what did Moses see? Did he see a blueprint? Did God unroll a huge blueprint and say, here's the dimension, Moses? Here's the plan, Moses? No, sir. It's a wonderful thing, and it's a true thing, that Moses saw the tabernacle of heaven itself. He saw it. You know, I, I wasn't quite convinced of this. I've, I've been very reluctant to accept that. I was sure that it must be that God revealed to Moses the dimension, the plans for the tabernacle. And I couldn't just quite get it in my heart that Moses actually saw the tabernacle in heaven. But did he not come back from the mount with a face that shone with the glory? So much so that he had to hang a veil over his face to separate the glorious shine of his face from the people. He came back from the mount. He had seen the very dwelling place of God. He had seen the real tabernacle in heaven, pitched not by man, but pitched by the Lord. And Moses knew when he came down from the mount that he was to put up a replica of what he had seen, that it might stand for centuries in Israel as the picture story of how God must be approached. And as you study the tabernacle, you will find this, dear brethren, is the key that unlocks the meaning of the tabernacle. It is all Christ. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. He is everything in the tabernacle. For I wondered, what is heaven's tabernacle like? It's all of Christ, for Christ the Lamb is the temple of it. He's everything in this tabernacle. And I begin to think when I was studying this tabernacle for these messages, I want to be very cautious not to make types the Holy Spirit hasn't made. But oh, when I begin to consider every portion of this tabernacle, I find that every type is established. He is the door. He is the linen righteousness over which no man can come lest he be a thief and robber. He is the door that will admit any man, but the door by which every man must come. He is the brazen altar. For at Calvary it was he who offered himself without spot and blemish unto God. It was him who was consumed in the wrath and the fires of God's judgment. It was him who was burned in the judgment and the damnation that belonged to sinners. And it was the smoke of that offering that was acceptable to God. He is the one by which we come for daily cleansing. And he is the great veil through which we pass into the very presence of God for worship and fellowship. 
He is the light in which we walk. He is the showbread that we feed on, for I let bread come down from heaven, he said. And he is the altar of incense by which we offer our prayers and thanksgiving to God. And he is the veil that separates man from God. And those who would enter into the Holy of Holies must come by him. And all brethren having boldness, therefore, to enter into the holiest of all, by a new living way, that is, by the blood of sprinkling, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to God, and there in the blood-sprinkled mercy seat of heaven between the golden chariot dims, we find peace and fellowship and communion with him. And I hope as we study the tabernacle, and this is only a preliminary message, this is only an introductory message to what we hope to see, I have one desire. It's been on my heart for weeks. Oh, that we might see Christ. That we might see him in every portion of this tabernacle. I'm not interested in the tabernacle. Hebrews 10.1 says it was a shadow and not the very image. I'm not interested in the shadow. I'm interested in the very image. I'm interested in heaven's tabernacle. I'm interested in heaven's priest, heaven's sacrifice, and heaven's blood-sprinkled throne. This is what we must see, brethren. Else our meeting together and our study together will be in vain. And if you're here tonight without Christ, and if you're outside the court, you have no portion with the priests. You have no access to God. There is a way. Thank God for there's a door. Any man could come. All he had to do was come to the door, and he would be admitted. The door is Christ. All you need to do is come to him. Where is he? Well, he's at God's right hand. You say, well, how can I go? They're well, of necessity, you'll have to go by faith. <laughs> you can't go by feet. You'll have to go by faith since he's at the right hand of God. But he's there. And he's as near the gospel, the book of Romans testifies, as your heart. Yea, in your very mouth. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be confounded. And oh, how I praise God tonight that there is a door, and that it's open, that any man outside that court can come by the brazen altar, by the labor of cleansing, through the veil, to the place of communion, yea, to the very presence of God, there in the shadow of the mercy seat sprinkled with blood, he will have peace with God through Christ. May we pray. Father, we rejoice tonight in this thy holy word, and we thank you for this glorious picture story which we've seen tonight of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that every man, woman, boy, and girl shall leave this building tonight seeing him. Oh, Father, we pray that Satan will be defeated in his attempt and in his effort to snatch from our hearts these precious words, keep our hearts fixed upon him. And should there be one among us who has never believed on Jesus, we pray that tonight they may see that they are outside the court, having no access to God. And also may they see, dear Father, in him a way which is right. For he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. These things we ask in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.